Good evening, everyone, and sorry about that technical delay. What's a webinar without some sort of Zoom glitch? Uh, thank you to all for joining me this evening for this webinar. My name is Carla Kennedy, and I'm the Aspire graduate in Badminton, Ireland this year. Uh, I'm delighted this evening to be joined by former Badminton Olympian Sonia McGinn and uh, juvenile national coach Michael O'Mara. Uh, before I do hand you over to Michael, I just want to make you aware of a few Zoom features that will help you with the webinar this evening. So this webinar will be facilitated by, by Michael. Um, if anyone is watching uh, has any questions for Sonia, you can write them in the Q&A box. This box is located in the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. If you do hover your mouse over this toolbar, you will be able to locate it. If anyone does have any technical issues during the presentation, please just pop me a message in the chat function or you can email me at kkennedy at badmintonireland.com. If you want to get my email address again, bear with me. Next slide. Um, it is just there at the end of the slide there if you do need me at any point during tonight's webinar. Um, so without further delay, as I'm aware, I've delayed it already to begin. And I do apologize profusely for that technical technical issue. Um, I do hope you enjoy this evening's webinar and I'll pass you over to Michael. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Michael O'Mara is my name on, on behalf of Munster Badminton in association with Badminton Ireland and also Women in Sport. I'd like to warmly welcome you all here this evening to our webinar aptly entitled Sonia McGinn, My Olympic Journey. Now, in the year 2000, Sonia McGinn became the first Irish badminton player to qualify for and compete in the Olympic Games in Sydney 2000. And I'm delighted tonight, as somebody who has played with and against Sonia for many years, to have the opportunity to speak with her and uh, get her to tell her story as to how she qualified for the Olympics. Before I get into grilling Sonia, I would like to say a few thank yous. Firstly, to David McGill of Badminton Ireland and more especially Carla Kennedy, who has been of huge help in the last few days, promoting the event and also um, setting up things on the technical side. I would also like to give a shout out to my friends and colleagues in Munster of Abington, uh, John Feeney, um, Betty Thompson, and more especially Trudy Kennedy, who has done an awful lot of work during this pandemic to stay in touch with players and, and actually inspired me to uh, set up this webinar this evening. So without further ado, I would like to introduce um, the star of the show this evening, our special guest, Sonia McGinn. Mike, how are you? Sonia, how are you for a start? Can you can you start by, I suppose, telling us, you know, are you have you been involved in the game since you retired in any capacity at all, at all? Or maybe tell us a bit about what you're doing now. Yeah, so now I got involved there about five years ago. One of um our good colleagues who you'd know well as well, Richard Vaughan, um, got involved with Babington Ireland uh, about five years ago and had asked would I get involved, um, which I did, um, with the under-13 team, um, which your son was part of, and loved every minute of it. It was brilliant. Um, when I had said I'd get involved, I said I'd like to take um, a younger age group where they're starting off, so you can put your, give your advice and you know, help them along the way, which, which we did. Brilliant squad of players, really, really eager to work and worked hard, which is what I loved and really enjoyed. Um, I did that for a year. Um, and then ever since really Sydney, I have opened my own health club, which was another goal of mine to do after the Olympics. Um, and I'm still involved with that, which is SV Fitness. And we're in the Dublin city, Dublin one. Um, and thankfully, I'm still involved in there and very busy. OK, well, look, I suppose with all stories, there has to be a beginning. So what I'd like to talk to you about, I mean, tell us a bit about the beginning. How did you start playing? Because I think every every uh, Olympic journey has to start with a dream at some stage. So where did it all start, Sonia? It started, my parents, there used to be a, a sports centre up in Hoth called Edros. And my parents were very involved um, with the running of it and they got involved obviously Babington they were very involved with Babington so they started looking after the Babington side of things 
So all of us, my brothers and my sisters, we'd all be down there along with a lot of other, obviously the locals around Hope, Sutton, all of that. So that's really where the Babington started. I was seven years of age, uh, took to it, loved it. It was full of kids. So I think it was more fun um, than anything else. Um, but that's when I started. So I was seven years of age. And I think then by the age of eight, I entered into a competition and that's when it all it all started. Um, I then was selected to go on a squad. And from there, I, I continued, so obviously all the age, through all the ages, all the way up. But it would have been seven. My parents would have started me off um, and got me going. And then I sort of went from there into squads where they took over um, with the badminton, really, and, and coaching. But it would have been hope. Okay. okay, and can I ask you? I suppose, like like every athlete, there's there's influences in everybody's career. So, who were your, I suppose, early influences on your career? Girls' wise, which you'll probably remember well, was Susie Susanti from Indonesia. Um, she was she was, I think, a lot of our heroes at that stage. She was brilliant. She used to glide around the court. I, you can still nearly picture her now. Um, but she was a brilliant, brilliant player. Um, and I think at that stage, it was one that we'd all sit and watch when she was playing. And then I suppose in the male side would have been Morton Frost. He was another big name in, in he was known as Mr. Babington in the Babington world. Um, so they would have been my two main ones within Babington. But outside Babington, I used to love on the tennis side, so a different sport, but what I thought Steffi Graf and Pete Sampras were, were other two big heroes. Um, and they were ones that I always sort of looked on. They always were number one seed and, you know, everyone wanted them to be beaten. I never did. I just thought they put so much work into it. Um, you know, I wanted them winning all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sort of way in sport, they were the two main ones that I would have looked sport wise. But in my own family, we'd be very sporty. So my granddad was an international rugby player. My aunt was an international golf player. Um, and I used to think, I, I never got to see my granddad, unfortunately, play, but I just heard so much about him. And then when I qualified for the games, um, a lot of, actually some lovely letters came in with regards to people who were following my progress, who knew my granddad, Freddie mm. Warren. Um, and then a few of my aunt's friends who she used to captain the Irish ladies golf were, were the same. So a lot of people influenced me in the sporting world and close to me. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I, I have a distinct and I'm sure and I do hope you remember this. But I do remember, I think it was, I'm going to guess World Championships 92 or 93, where you actually got to play Susie Cezanti. And I specifically remember um, you won the toss and um, you aced her off the serve. She thought you were going to serve high. You served short. And we all screamed at you just to, to um, quit because of injury, because at least you could say you won while you were <laughs> except you had stopped from injury. Um, and, and it's very interesting that, um, you know, you, you talk about the people who... Um, and can I ask you about, I suppose, your parents? What, how would they have influenced you and encouraged you? Because I think the role of parents in sport is a very important one. Massive. And it's, it's, it's ironic, actually, because my, my parents were behind me from, from day one. And when I was younger, I was involved in a lot of sports and they let me play all the sports. And some people, especially when I was coming up to under 15s, under 16s, people were saying, oh, she shouldn't be playing different sports. She should only be playing one sport. And my parents sort of always gave me the option that if I wanted to go off and run or if I wanted to go off and golf or play tennis or whatever the sport I wanted to do, it was always my decision. They were always behind it. And at that stage, I loved all the sports. Badminton was obviously the one I was doing. I was most successful at at the time. But um, they always encouraged me. And as the years went on and coming into Olympic, obviously, qualification, like everyone, you can always have people who are fully behind you and people who can knock you. Um, they always, always were supportive. And I think for any child, no matter what age they are, I think your parents are, you know, are your biggest influencers in that. 
And if you have their backing behind you, you're you're a step of everybody. I was I was only asked by a girl. I've obviously in my gym, a health club, so I'd be chatting to a lot of people. And the Instagram post came up about my this webinar now this evening. And a girl came into me into my office, and she goes, "Do you know what? My dream was always to try and get to an Olympics." And she says, um, "Unfortunately, I didn't have the support behind me." And that's where I was trying to say how lucky I was that I had my parents behind me through good times and bad times, you know, um, because it is a long journey. And because I was lady singles, it's, it's a, it can be a lonely um, sort of an experience. Um, being the only one traveling to most of the competitions, it definitely was. Thankfully, I'm, I'm a social enough person and, and will go up and chat to people. So I made a lot of really, really good friends um, yeah. who I'd still be very much in contact today. But to go back to your point, my parents are a massive influence and they were with my career, 100%. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting you say that because I think, um, you know, and I think there's, there'll be a lot of parents listening and, I'm, and you're a parent and I'm a parent myself. I, I think it can be a very difficult place to be at times. And I speak personally in that regard yeah. um but, but i do think that any um any athlete that has been successful it's they, they've basically been able to do it because their parents were very firmly in your in your corner so a big shout out to dick and pauline if they're both watching um and i hope they're both keeping well sonia i wanted to take you on to um i suppose when you started to uh, with your olympic qualification um it was obviously for sydney so you probably would have started maybe in probably 1999 um where did you train with whom and how did your sessions work who did you practice with so my brain i i loved training and i i sort of always loved to be on the go which you'd probably remember on some of the the competition yeah. so I'd, yeah. I'd be warming up nearly two hours before i was due on and um, so my training so i my whole background i was in college uh, studying sports and um, leisure management and fitness at that stage i loved it, it was an industry i loved so I sort of had done all my program with regards to gym work, with regards to on the court, but literally during the court who helped me um, and a, a big shout out again were two of our top under 18 players at that stage, which was Brian Smith and Lucy Corcoran and then Mary Dynan. And they come down to the court with me every day. Um, Monday, Monday to Friday anyway. And Brian and Lucy would come straight after school and they put in a good hour and a half with me, which was which was brilliant, you know. So there was always two or three on the other side of the court. Mary would be always at the side of the court, stopping and starting and yelling at me if if I wasn't, you know, doing something or but they'd they'd be with me five days. So my, my training session again, depending if it was during season or off season. So Generally during season, I'd have a court session in the morning, which would generally be myself and then Mary. The afternoon would be a gym session. The afternoon would be a, a second court session. And then before either club, if I had club or didn't have club, I would always do a good half hour to quarter of hour, just pure footwork session on my own. Um, so it was, it was a lot of training. Um, and then during the summer, I used to go, thank God, which was, which was brilliant. I'd be invited with the Scottish team. Also, there was a European selection where I could train in the Far East during the summer. And that was, that was a massive experience for me, but one that I loved because it was pure training. It was guided with people, you know, who were top in their field, whether they were psychologists, physiotherapists, coaches, which is something, unfortunately, we didn't have here that was on my court at all the time. So I'd have a month of that during the summer, which was something I used to love. Um, and then before that, I got my first experience really in the Far East. When I was only 13, I was invited to the World Championships were in Indonesia. And again, I don't think I let my parents away with it, but I was sent over to Indonesia on my own at 13. And being a parent, I don't think I'd send my daughter there, but it was brilliant. It was a massive experience. I was to meet the English um, team in Heathrow, which some of them, Erlingus brought me over. 
But training over there, when I got out of the plane at the start, I nearly died because of the heat. So when I was doing my summer training with the European team and the Scottish, I said, I want to be a lot more prepared. So I used to train in a sauna. I used mm. to bring a spinning bike into the sauna and train in there for a good hour after my gym session. But it was more just to get used to the heat. So when I was training over there, I'd be able to do the high intensity training and the, the heat wouldn't wouldn't bother me. Sure. Um, can, it's interesting you said that, um, you know, that you, you were always on the go and, um, uh, you know, and, and certainly I, that would be true for my, my memory of you. Um, so listen, I, I wanted just to ask you, you know, I suppose what you're saying there is... Uh, very interesting because what it does point to it points to two things. It points to number one, you know, how much you had to do on your own, which I think probably stood to you very much because if you're in the heat of battle um, in a match or a big match you needed to win, you would have been used to standing on your own two feet, making your own decisions rather than having somebody else to do it for you. But I think what it also does is it also shows how far, which is a very positive thing, Babington in Ireland has come. Um, to um, indeed sport as Ireland in Ireland has come to today whereby we have a fantastic high performance set up um, based in, in Blanchardstown now so I think it's it's fantastic that, um, that that we can look at that with a lot of pride now but at the same time I suppose looking back to you and your qualification period I think you should take um, huge um, pride out of having to do and actually succeeding with, with, with limited resources can I ask you um, if it's okay to ask you, um, it must have been very costly. Was there any financial um, financial uh, support back in those days from any quarter? Again, I was lucky. Uh, so obviously in the start of it, my, my parents would have funded a lot of it. And then once you started bringing in results, sport, um, Babington Ireland was able to do a small bit, but the Olympic Council and obviously the Sports Council of Ireland, they were they were brilliant with me. So obviously you get your sports grant, which is through the National Lottery. Um, but for me, qualifying for the Games, being the first, we, we really didn't know. No, none of us knew. We were all new to it. How to qualify, we just knew we had to be, say, in the top 60 in the world. And how to get there was, at that stage, we thought playing as many competitions, get as many points as you want. And the more points you get, you will move up the world rankings, is what we thought. Yeah. So, we so that, br that brings me to the first question that's actually come in. <clears throat> um, it's from somebody who's anonymous, um, so I don't know who it is, um, <laughs> which is strange. But it basically says, um, I, I suppose, a couple of things. One, um, what was your target for the Olympics? Um, was it to qualify? Was it to win a few rounds? Um, was it to win a medal? And I suppose also they're asking what what world ranking did you need to have to qualify for the Olympics? So a few okay. questions there for you. Yeah. So um, the world ranking you had to be in, we had said we'd need to be in the top 60. I was 54. And the reason being for that is the 32 draw, but you're only allowed to have three from each country. So we knew in China, in the top 10, they were going to have five. So it frees up a few more spaces. So we sort of had an idea where we needed to be. My aim definitely was obviously to qualify for the Olympics. And it was really a four year preparation program for it, with the final year being the main year. Um, so at that stage, I knew fitness wise where I was. I knew how I'd been doing in competitions. Um, and I was feeling very confident in myself. At that stage, we didn't know if I was going to qualify or not because we still didn't really know the procedures. So for me, obviously the year coming into it, my big aim was to qualify for the Olympic Games. And that was my big target. And to do it on my own, you know, and obviously the team, we had in Ireland, John Feeney was there, Marie Weldrick O'Connor was there. Um, and they were brilliant. So they were checking out all the competitions and different things. And we were literally just sending me to all of them to get the, the points in. But my aim at that stage was to get to the Olympics. And once I got to the Olympics, I knew I was in peak fitness at that stage. We really had peaked at the right time. And I was hoping, really, really hoping to get as, as far as I can. And I think if I was doing it again and I was in the same situation, 
you know, things could have been so different because you would have been so mentally prepared for it, you know. And if, you know, you had a bit more time, like one of the, the guys I met before, Sydney, and unfortunately it was only a month or two nearly before it was a gentleman called Giles Warrington. And he, he was just brilliant. He actually changed part of my training program. He actually made me do less, you know, um, and it was just amazing. I was going sort of giving out saying, surely I can't do less. I need to keep doing more and more and more. But it's amazing when you have the right team behind you, which Ireland does now, how it really can help with your performance. And I'd, I would have loved to be having what Badminton Ireland has now. And it's brilliant to see it. And I'm delighted that Ireland is where it is now. Sonia, can I ask you, um, in terms of qualification, I suppose, having looked at players over the years, um, obviously there's a lot of pressure. One week you're in, one week you're out. It, you know, it's not just about winning a match. It's about beating people, getting points. So it can be a bit of a roller coaster. So was it a bit of a roller coaster, you know, in terms of one week being in a qualifying period, one week being outside it? And how did you, how did you deal with that? How did you handle that? Yeah, so again, that was all new to us. So what we didn't realise, which was the sort of two years before, so even the four years, um, but more importantly, the two years before the Games, we were, I was going to all these different competitions and gaining points and I was doing really well in them, which was fantastic. But coming up to Olympic year, any competitions I would have played in in September, say, 98, if I didn't play or didn't do as well in that competition the following year, I'd lose all those points. Okay. So I could go from 40 in the world today to 50 in the world tomorrow. And it purely was that you lose points as the year goes by. So a competition I play in September, I lose all those points okay. in September the following year. So coming up to it, my Olympic ranking was going up and down, you know, because I would have done so well in competitions in one year and then the following year I didn't play in them and we didn't realise the effect that was having until the Olympic year. So it was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a major roller coaster right up until when I was qualifying and it was only probably the last few months we realised really what was happening. So we sort of planned the last few competitions and plus, depending on certain competitions and certain levels, they're worth different points, you know? Um, so this was all stuff we sort of probably realized a bit too late, um, but thankfully we, we realized early enough for me to get in. So the last two competitions I played in were Peru and Chile, and I had to try and get to the finals of both of them. And thankfully I did. So um, that that gave us, you know, a brilliant sort of positive feeling because it definitely pushed me then into the top 60, which was which was excellent. But to, to answer your question, Mike, it was a roller coaster. Yeah. Well, I think I think in fairness to you, you were the first. Um, nobody had really gone down that road before. So you were charter, chartering on chartered waters or sailing on chartered waters, if you like. Um, and I think there's no question in qualifying, Sonia, you certainly did um, set the standard and I suppose um, say to so many young girls out there, hey, you know what, this is doable because I've done it. And, and we since have had uh, Chloe McGee, who has qualified on a number of occasions, um, which is fantastic as well. So can mm -hmm. I just ask you, um, how did you find out you actually qualified and what was the feeling like? So I can remember perfectly clear. It was five past nine on the first of May and the phone rang and my mum answered it and I was in my room and she just says, oh, it's for you. Didn't say anything else. And Marie, who worked in Babington, Ireland at that stage, was brilliant. She, she was nearly like a second mum. Like she did all the bookings. She dealt with my parents on everything and sort of said, this is what we're going to do next and booked all the things. And she phoned me um, and she she was nearly in tears telling me before she said anything. So I didn't know if I was getting good news or bad news, but thankfully it was good news. And um, the even now, it's, it's a memory I'll always remember. And when anyone asks me, it's one that I will, I always get goosebumps from because it was something that I worked 
so hard from I never knew if it was going to happen or not because we really didn't know how to go about it apart from trying to get the world rankings up. Um, so yeah, so I, I remember really clearly phoned my mom and my, obviously my dad was in work at that stage, but it was just such a brilliant feeling for me and my parents. Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, to have the word Olympian after your name is, is once you have it, you have it. It's something you can always say and it's something to be uh, absolutely immensely proud of. So talk to me about Sydney uh, 2000 when you got there. What was your draw like? Who did you get? Give us a bit of an insight. So, yeah, so a bit unlucky, really. So I got me Dina in, in my, well, it was, I got a buy in the first, so it threw into the second. And when I saw the draw, I was, I was like, oh, flip. But either way, I said, God, this will, this can be a good game. Um, because we played before, had a really good game. She's super player, really, really super player. But I knew I had it just on how I was feeling, um, you know, into it training was going so well my fitness level was where I was I was really confident with my badminton at that stage and um, so at that stage I just had to be mentally prepared for it so I had even seen myself if I get through this the next round I'd beaten the girl um before so I was really hoping um you know that I was going to get further Unfortunately, uh, Mia beat me. The first set didn't go as well. She beat me in the second set by a point, um, which was a pity. But again, if I was to do it all again, which I would have loved it, mentally, you'd, you know, you'd, you'd be in a different place. You'd be in a better place. And I was, I was well prepared, both physically and mentally. Before, before I went to Sydney, like a good year before it, I actually went to see a guy to help me with hypno hypnosis with you know preparing yourself mentally for training and that was the best ever you know because it really prepared me to focus on my match I can't I can remember walking into the stadium I remember roars but I don't remember anything else I just remember going and putting my rackets into my basket you know um a but, sense, a sense of what, what emotions, because uh, I can only imagine it, if I was in your shoes, I would imagine my heart would be pumping out through my chest with pride. So, what emotions were going through your head? Yeah, and it, it's really strange because when I think of it now, the excitement of it is unbelievable. But when I was there, I was so focused. I had a, a sort of like a training program for fitness. I had a training program for my head to prepare me for my match to prepare me. I'd watched obviously videos of Mia playing, how she was going to play, how I was going to play her. I'd taken into account of the hole that we were playing in and what I had to be careful of and stuff like that. So I remember walking in, I remember so many of my friends who traveled over, um, which I couldn't believe it, that were in the, in the stand. Um, a load of our own Irish team athletes, they'd all come in as well. And I remember reading a headline the next day that uh, Sonia walked out to the court. It was like a football match, that the cheers were so loud. I can't remember as much of that, which I would have loved, but I can remember it, but not as much because I think I was so focused. Mm. Um, and obviously it's, it's gone now. I would have loved to have seen what happened if I did win that, you know, second set, how things would have gone. Um, but you know what? Getting there is a is a big thing. And as you said, and actually it was only there a few years ago. Obviously, I have a gym and people say you should have something with the Olympics and all on it and, and stuff like that. And was a friend of my dad's who's a massive sports fan. He actually himself and his wife actually came over to Sydney with us. And he always said, Sonia, never forget once you're an Olympian, you're always an Olympian. And it was something I think only as I've got older. My, I sort of look back and sort of realise, God, yeah, I, you know, I had to go through an awful lot to mm. get to where I was, you know, where I think growing up in those ages, I, I was just so determined that mm. my mind was just so set in, you, you just train, 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 be the fittest you can, 
mm. be the best you can and try and be better than everybody else. You know, that was more my mental attitude. I have a few questions for you that are coming in that I think we should uh, we should get to. Um, one person here just says women's badminton. Again, I don't know who it is. It says, what shot do you think defines your style of play? Um, I used to like the slice and cross court drops. I used to love that. The deceptive ones now. Yeah. Um, deceptive. Okay. Yeah, I used to. I used to love love them. Um, and I used to practice, 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 practice them. Okay. Okay. And I have a question from um, this is Trudy Kennedy down in in um, uh, Watford. Uh, good evening to you, Trudy. Trudy asks, what advice would you give a young player during a match when things are not going well? Okay. I would definitely say and i and to kids and adults i would literally say you take your time nearly the old thing that you're told by your coach bend down tie your lace and just take your time it's really unfortunate when things are going wrong and the one thing we all do wrong is we go back into an attacking mode and um, depending what you're playing so if it's singles if it's doubles if it's mixed they'll all be slightly different Singles, you have to be patient. You have to be patient. You need to learn how to slow the game down and how to speed the game up. So if we're talking about a child um, and they're playing singles, I would say bend down, tie your lace and just take a time out. Try and think of your game and who you're playing and what you want to do. So a lot of, I used to always have a diary when I was sort of more underage. And everyone I played, I'd write down their weaknesses or their strengths. And before I'd go out and play them, I would have a game plan. So I'd say, right, I know this person's always going to drop when they go to their right corner. Or they're always going to do a cross court or they love attacking or, you know, they've no patience or just to tire them out. Just keep rallying them and tire them out. So what I would say is, if things aren't going right, have a breather. Go and take a drink and just say to yourself, right, what do I need to do? And reset and, and take your time. Just patience. Okay, so to any, any of our junior members who might be listening tonight, the, uh, the advice from our Olympian is if things aren't going well, just take a chill pill. Just take a deep breath. Take it easy. That's, that's the advice. And I would have to say that's very, very good advice. Um, somebody else, um, Nado, I don't know who it is, wants to know, um, what was your highest world ranking? My high school ranking was 54. 54. And then in Europe, it was four. Okay. okay. So. And somebody from the Premier County, Kieran O'Brien, is asking, on the technical side, is, is there anything that you learned, I suppose, in your early years that you needed to change as you got older and better? And I'm reading, what would you see? Yeah. What was, was there anything technically that you, you felt the need to change or decided to change or had to change as you progressed? I think um, I was always eager to learn or change things if I needed to. So that's where I loved when I got the opportunity to train, you know, in the Far East with Europeans, because you were, you were dealing with different coaches who would definitely teach you different ways. Um, and I used to always remember then coming back from Ireland and just being on such a high because, and it might have been, purely you know dropping shoulders too low coming into the net or two big steps when you're going from the base of the court to the back or to the front you know it's all about getting to the shot quicker and sooner taking the shot quicker and sooner so i i think more it would have been more that way um i used to love as well again going back to the shot that i would have loved which is the slice the cross court deceptive um i used to love trying to see and know a point on the shuttlecock on where i precisely had to hit it or how i had to follow through or if you had to do a full follow through or if it was more just the speed of the racket action itself um so you, you, you do always learn and then you always try to just make it better. But if something's going right for you, I would definitely say don't, <laughs> don't change it. You know, what I, I think that's... What I find interesting there is you use the word taking it early. And I've always believed that some of the most important words in Babington, the three words are early, early and early. So yeah. when, when you tell us about 
it's important to take the shuttle early. I think, again, if there's any juveniles listening, you heard it from an Olympian tonight. Uh, it, it is so important to take the shuttle early, particularly at the net. Can I ask you, Sonia, um, um, let me see what other questions are coming in here. Yeah, somebody... Um, Somebody whose daughter is a very, very, very promising up and coming um, uh, player at the moment, uh, who should remain nameless, says, Hi, Sonia, great interview. Can I ask if you planned to go for a second Olympics given the positive experience you had with Sydney? And that's I, from Jack Noble. I, 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 would, I would love to, even, even now when I look back on it or conversations like this come back up, I'd, I, I'd love to, but. As my parents know, the year of the games, I had actually said to them, I said, this is it. I either going to make it or I'm not going to make it, but this will be my last chance. I, I was 26. I had been on a, like a world circuit really from the age of 15. And I think at that stage, I sort of felt right. I've done what I can do. Um, so it's, it's either going to be now or never. And thank God it, I, I got it. So a second wouldn't have been at that stage. I think the body was giving in. Um, and I think you get to a stage where if your body or you're not, not that you're not enjoying it, but there's an awful lot of traveling in it um, and that stage and you give up a lot, you know, um, to, to, to try and to try and achieve that and at that stage you know I, I I was away so much so I don't think I could have done um another year I'd, I'd love to now if my body was fit enough I'd love to go again but um I and I would have and especially now where Babington Ireland is it's it's fantastic like they've so much more advice there's so much help mm. having you know sports HQ is superb and when I was competing, obviously, I trained court one in Balderoy Badminton Centre, and I was so appreciative of the hall and having it so close by. But like friends of mine that were in Scotland or England, they had brilliant setups at that stage, you know, and thankfully I got invited to train over there. But to answer her question, I would have loved to done the second Olympic. Yeah. Listen, I, I'm going to slightly break from questions for here for a moment because... Um, a good friend of ours, Seamus Talpin, recently gave us a, 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 it was a, the article from, I can't remember the year, but it was Ireland v France, France in Navan in 1990, whatever. And on the night you actually played against a girl called, do you remember? Sandra Dimbor. Yeah. Um, so what I'd like to do now is I'd like to ask Carla if she would um, call Sandra Dimbor. No. To the webinar, please. Yeah, just doing that now, you, Michael. One second. And I should say, Sandra also played in the Olympic Games for France um, in uh, 2000. And the reason we've invited her on is because her and Sonia would have been really good friends and have kind of kept in touch for many, many years. So that's Sandra, are you there? I was only talking to her the other day. Yeah, well, there you go. On you Facebook. should be able to hear you now. Sandra. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Sandra. Sandra, bon Sandra bonsoir. Bonsoir. <laughs> Sandra, thank you very much. that, Sandra. <laughs> Sandra, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And I suppose what I'd like to do is, I don't know if you remember that match in, in Navan, but I suppose I, I brought you on as, as a friend of Sonia's for many years. And I, I wanted to see if you had a particular memory or anything that you wanted to share with Sonia from maybe matches that you played against each other or, or, or maybe even from Sydney? Uh, there's a lot of um, things I remember about Sonia during all the years we've been playing uh, on the same tournaments. Uh, the, the match in 98 was quite difficult uh, for me for a moment. I think it was more difficult for Sonia at the end of the match. <laughs> it, it was, thanks. <laughs> Uh, but um, no, just what I remember was really uh, the, the determination you had on court and uh, the fighting spirit all the time it was never finished. The matches, even if you were up or down, that it was never finished for uh, 
uh, we had to, to win the, the last point all the time before making sure we were winning against uh, Sonia. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was very good. I just have very good souvenirs uh, about that. I'm sorry about my English because, because I didn't speak English for a long time. <laughs> but, uh, and I've been traveling all day because we have to come back home tonight. But um, not just, uh, I, was, um, I was going to do everything to be there tonight to have a, a little chat with, uh, with Sonia tonight. <laughs> Sandra, I think there was two of us now with the fighting spirit, to be honest. We had, we, we had many a battles, a ve yeah. very good battles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Very good battles. And, uh, we, we, we always shook hands at the end of it. And, yeah. and, and thankfully, I was just saying, because I was only on uh, Facebook to you the other day, because the memories of, of Sydney came up. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Which, which is great to keep, be able to, to keep in touch with with friends that you'd have seen each other nearly every week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sandra, thank you very much for joining us this evening. It's a pleasure to have you, um, pleasure to have you uh, join us. And I, I'm sure Sonia forgives you for, for beating her in Navin. Um, I, I don't. Stress, I should stress <laughs> that Ireland won the match that night. Um, it was won in the final match by a men's doubles and uh, we won't go into who played that match. But Sandra, thank you very much for joining us and bonsoir. Bonsoir. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sandra. Okay, so a couple of questions for you, Sonia. Um, Patricia, Patricia Gallagher in Warford wants to know, um, did you try out all events, uh, you know, doubles and mixed, and when did you decide to specialise in singles? You can briefly uh, give her an answer to that. I, uh, I, I did. I tried all events, especially underage. I played all events, um, singles, doubles, and mixed. The more I got into senior, um, I in a few of the competitions that I played in um, on the world circuit was was brilliant. I was accompanied with Keelan Fox, who played with me and was brilliant to have when she could come on some of the competitions, the tournaments. It was great to have companionship, um, and and she was brilliant to have there. Mixed wasn't my specialty. I have to admit, I think Mike, I played with yourself once or twice. Um, me staying at the net really wasn't something I, I favoured. I preferred to move around. Um, so generally my mixed was a bit mixed up, mixed. It was more doubles than, than anything else. Um, singles, singles was my main one, but I did play singles and doubles. And when we travelled on the Irish team as well, I would have played a good few um, doubles with that as well. So singles was my obviously number one. Um, but I did play singles and doubles abroad. In Ireland, I played a good few singles, doubles and mixed, but primarily good. singles and doubles. I have a question here from um, another legend of the game, uh, Eugene McKenna, who you will know quite well. Yeah. Eugene, Eugene asks the question, what do you think is the advantage of playing different sports when you were young? And at what stage do you think you should concentrate on a single sport? Brilliant. And I, I actually get asked this quite a bit because I have two daughters and they play a load of different sports. I think you should try and let the kids play in as many sports as they can. Uh, now, again, it's up to parents to use their heads if some are very physical and it's not their main sport. Maybe ease off on that a little bit. But I played up until I was under 18, I was playing, I was actually on a golf squad as well. So I was badminton, golf, swimming, running, tennis, um, and I played all of them. After that, once it was more going for Olympics, um, during my badminton season, some of them I was told not to play as much of. Okay. Um, okay which I did, but I would let, I will definitely let my girls play right up until, you know, they're 18. But again, I have to see if they specialize in anything and that's where you have to. So everyone's going to be different. If the kids are good at all the sports, let them play it because they will find out what sport they prefer themselves and they'll naturally go that way. But I think to have, and more now than ever, I think sport is brilliant for kids. They're meeting totally different people in each sport. Okay. So it mightn't be particularly the sport that they want. It could be the people that they're having great fun at. And I think sport is fantastic. You want to get there um, and work really hard, but it's really important you enjoy it at the same time. Because if you enjoy it, 
you'll do better at it. Okay. okay. Sonia, a question here from um, Norman Pontanosa, whose kids are, are um, particularly Vinny is, is a junior international. Um, uh, a question is, what sort of... Pre- what, what preparation did you have on the nutrition side back in those days? How how were you as regards your diet? Was there any major do's or don'ts? Because today it's a much more scientific world we live in. So how did you approach nutrition? Again, I did it all myself. Um, it was only that really the year of qualifying for the Olympics. So 99, um, the Olympic Council, I just asked if, you know, they were saying, do you need any more help with anything? I said, I'd love for some to check my whole nutrition and diet. I was really strict on my diet anyway. Um, so, you know, takeouts or McDonald's or sweets. I really didn't go down. I have a really sweet tooth. So, of course, you'd go and you'd, you'd enjoy what you want. You were burning everything off. You were working hard at it. So it would never dawn on you. But... Again, I go back, my parents, my mum would have had all my meals ready. So I'd get up, I'd have my breakfast, I'd go train, I'd come home and have lunch, I'd go to the gym, I'd come home and have a snack. I'd have my dinner there. Um, It's really all about eating healthy where you can. You can still obviously go and enjoy the treats, especially at that, Mm -hmm. and especially youngsters, I wouldn't go too much into it, but Mm -hmm. trying to get them into the eating healthy, you know, the meats, the proteins, a a lot of them know that now, I think health and fitness is, and it's my industry, you know, but it's, it's at a totally different level now, there's, there's Mm -hmm. kids that will, you know, even at the age of 12 or 13, nearly know what they want to eat, um, but yeah. for diet wise, I didn't really speak with a, a nutritionist until the year of it. And thank God, I suppose it's an area I trained in. So she mm-hmm. was very happy with it. So I, I really didn't have to change too much. Okay. okay. I have a very interesting question here for somebody called somebody called Cormac. And it basically says, um, Sydney would have been pre-social media and YouTube. Does Sonia have any footage in her archives of her Olympic match? I I don't. I think RTE might, or obviously was televised. Um, I I don't. I had very little. Now my dad was brilliant at saving all the newspaper articles. He actually has a huge, big sort of folder of all the newspaper clippings and everything, which again he hadn't really said to me. He kept. Um, but that was lovely. He only gave that to me there, you know, a few years ago, which was lovely again to look back on. I think. I, I was so focused, I think, on just one thing that everything around me, I really didn't notice even the coverage or media or my door to E up in the house. It was just, right, yeah, I'm done. Now I need to get training. I didn't notice half the stuff. But uh, or to e, I know, definitely have stuff um, archived. And with regards to all newspaper clippings, I have a massive folder and box yeah. of them. Yeah, I actually have... Um... And you could, you'll remember this, Sonia, we played Japan in Tipperary Town. And I think it was 1992. I actually have that match on old VHS, but I've put it on a DVD. It's very grainy, but I actually do have your match on that. And I have all our matches on that. Um, and I, I have promised to give it to um, Adika Rafferty for the Babington Archives, which I will. So I do have you back in 1992 playing, playing an international match. Oh, um, so which I give you a copy of at some stage. Um, what What are your thoughts on? I suppose some times people will say, "Well, if you're if you're good enough, you're old enough." At what stage do you think young players today who are maybe really good, you know, and maybe above their age group in terms of standard, what age should they be? Should they be entering the senior um, um, competitions, competitions, and stuff like that? What's your thoughts on that? I think um, par- this is where parents and coach make a, play a massive role because I remember when I was under 16, um, even under 15, I was playing, uh, sorry, under 14, I was playing under 16s, under 18s and on senior. And I remember we had a meeting, my parents were called in to have a meeting um, to say that, and it's again different opinions. People were saying that I'd be burnt out because I'm playing in too much and I'm on different teams. And 
the under 16s I should be only playing on that but then the under 18s I was asked to play on that so I think for the parents you know if you are 13 14 and you're asked to play under 16 absolutely it's a brilliant experience and they should do that if they're playing then under 14 under 16 and under 18 I would let them but I would also minimize it so their own age group is their big one and an age up is absolutely perfect two ages up to be playing under three age is is probably quite a lot again it all depends on the child though because I used to love it I never used to think I was doing too much and um, I used to sort of go what's what's the problem like I'm not tired I enjoy it I want to go out and play the older people because I want to try and beat the older people you know so I think for someone who is under age I think for the parents and the coach you try and help make the decision and make it as easy as possible for the child but if they're happy enough and you feel it doesn't affect them mentally that it knocks them in any way let them do it absolutely okay. you just don't want to knock a child that's the biggest thing because they don't know how to deal with that so you have to to take them now when they're obviously older they will but at that age I think if they want to and they're eager enough to play in it once it's not the coach's decision saying we want you playing in this and the child doesn't want to if the child doesn't want to you don't end okay. up but if the child does you let them go for it okay there's a question here from somebody women's badminton and they're they're they've picked up on the fact that it, uh, oh you like the deceptives who is your do you have any favorites in terms of uh players in the world today any 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 particular say women that you would um really really think i suppose you would support as a player or you think is fantastic for yeah, any particular I, I, reason? I'd nearly go back to our time when we were playing and I would go Susie Susanti or Camilla Martin again they yeah. were two of the most I think deceptive singles players um ever and you'd always get them like Susie you, you hadn't a clue a lot of the time whether it was dropping the wrist was just fantastic um and Camilla Martin was another one you know you always it was just that last minute where the wrist action would change and she would drop the shuttle and you were on your way to the back of the court so deception wise i think they were two definitely outstanding yeah. and anybody in the modern game or Lin Dan. Lin Dan was brilliant i know he's but he was another player that really excited me i think with regards to his playing his personality he he was just he was just brilliant i have to say one of my favorites in the game today is actually a women's singles player from chinese taipei uh and i don't even know if i'm pronouncing her name right uh sai Tzu ying i think yeah. she's one of the, I, I think of any players in the world male or female uh her stroke production and her technical ability or deceptive is just it's an absolute joy to watch um somebody here is asking me about um uh you know, Olympians often talk about post games blues, um, the low after the high. Did you suffer from any blues when you came back? Was there any? Thankfully, I didn't. Thankfully, I didn't. Um, I think I had made my decision before, obviously, the year of the Olympic Games that it was that that was it. I was retiring. I was on such a high obviously from the Olympics. I, I was on a bit of a downer after my game because I was gutted. I was out of it and I really thought I was going to go further. I really thought, because I sort of said, right, if I beat me at the next person, I, I, you know, I've played and I was going to, I would have been confident. When I got home, I knew what I was getting into and it was going to be again in the fitness industry. So I was setting up my own health club and I was also setting up my own uh, sports massage clinic. Because when I was in Sydney, that was one that every athlete was looking for. And still today, um, I think deep tissue massage is the way to, to go for. So thankfully, I didn't go through the, the blues, but I do know um, a good few friends who did retire both in Sydney and after, who really went into a, a dark hole, which, which isn't, um, which isn't any, nice. any advice on how to deal that with that, which was uh, part of yeah. the question as well. So one that I had spoke to before, 
ideally it's really having a plan and I suppose having you know qualifications and stuff behind you is a big plus because when you're at the Olympics you're on you're you're at the top of your sport so you're at a high and everyone you know wants to be part of it and stuff like that when you come away from that and you go into a totally different field you're not top of your field there's loads more that are top of your field so I would always try and say you know take a bit of time off think what you want to do because it's still it's still in your control you know there's so much out there that you can do you have to think of what you want to do it's the same as you want to get to the Olympics, you go for it. Don't let anyone knock you. You have the tools to get you there. You just have to have the right headspace to get you there. And when you come home from the Olympic Games, your headspace is the most important because mm. you have to have something to fall into after or you can feel you sort of wasted time. So like I was 26, the Olympics, I had plans, I knew what I was doing when I was coming back and I was walking into it when I came back. Um, I got on very well with the media as well. So a lot of them, I got a good bit of coverage when I came back as well, which also helped. Um, but I think for someone retiring, I'd always say, you know, the year or two before, have a good think, have a plan in mind um, and sort of plan there. Because unfortunately with sport, you, you can get an injury. I, I was hoping to get the Atlanta Olympics and I got a knee injury and that knocked me. So you never know. And the sporting world is, is very tough. It's great um, when everything's going well, but if you get an injury the next day, that could be your career gone. So you do want yeah. really to have a, something in the background, like a plan B. Yeah, yeah. I, my own personal view is I do think there should be um, a plan B, as you call it yourself, even with athletes today. I, I think what, while our high performance athletes in every sport go full time, I do think it should absolutely be linked to a third level qualification, even to the extent that it should be, well, if you're getting funding, pick your course in college. So the two should go hand in hand, because yeah. as you say, it's important to have a plan B when you come out. Um, I have a comment here from somebody that says, Sonia, so impressed with your positive attitude and upbeat answers, uh, so detailed. And that's from a lady called Nina. Um, so, you, um, so Sonia, um, would you have any advice for younger players today who are looking at you and saying, well, you know what, I would, I'd like to be like her, I'd like to be an Olympian. Would you give any advice to them? I would. I would say, um, an Olympics is a super experience. So if it is something that you want to do, you go for it. It's a lot of work. Um, again, as I say to my two girls who both want to get to Olympics in different sports, um, you have to put the effort into it. You're not, nobody is naturally gifted, you know, so much both mentally and physically to just get there. You know, you have to put in the physical work, you have to put in the mental work, you have to be so mentally strong. So for the young people, I would say, if you want to get to Olympics, it is a super experience. I'd say go for it. Um, but do definitely be prepared that you have to put in the work. So you always have to try and be fitter than the person ahead of you. Always, always put in more work. If they're running five miles, you run five and a half, you know. But um, I would say enjoy it, first of all, because once you enjoy it, the training will be a lot easier. Um, so for the younger people, I'd say if it's a dream, absolutely go for it and work hard. Yeah, and I suppose just one thing I would throw in on that is for any younger players, it would be important to talk to the guys in Babington, Ireland in, in the HP setup so you can understand. And I suppose that this is something that Sonia didn't have the benefit of, but um, any younger ones should talk to Dan to understand what it is that they need to do to get funding and stuff like that, because that's there is a pathway there now that uh, certainly wasn't there in Sonia's day. Sonia, a question um, from Leinster Babington. Given your dedication to your Babington career, did it impact much on your social life? Uh, no, and it's, it, well, it did in some ways, but that was one thing I always tried to keep a balance, um, that I would train. So I never, I never drank or anything like that. So it would always, I would always make sure 
that I would get out if there was a friend's birthday or a party or someone was doing something. I'd always get the training in and go to that party. So mm. even to this day now, and I think a lot of athletes, even when I was in Sydney, it was one thing that was pointed out that a lot of athletes sort of devoted their whole life to their sport and missed out very much on the friendship outside that. Mm. To mm. me, you have to have friendships outside your sport. I have a lot of friends within Babington, in mm. Ireland and around the world, but I have super friends outside um, the, the sport. Mm. And I think to keep them, you know, to have friends like that is fantastic. I was never pressurized into having drinks or anything like that. You know, but I think it's definitely really important to have friends and family behind you all the time, because if you have that, they're your number one supporters that will be behind you, whether it's good or bad. So with the social side, I, I definitely still had. But obviously it was all it was nothing too hectic. But no, okay. I, I love socializing and I, and I still do. And if I was talking to any athletes now in my health club, we have a lot of athletes. And it's the one thing I would be saying you know, to them, definitely go out and enjoy yourself. And, you know, coming up to an event or anything like that, you just, you just calm yourself down. So it's, about, it's really about using your head, but having a proper balance. Yeah. Here's a question from um, a friend of mine down, um, not too far from Chile, Michelle Corr, um, who's a very active badminton coach down there. Hi, Michelle. Michelle is basically just saying, was there ever a time when you were either a juvenile player or, yeah, particularly a juvenile player where, you felt like giving up maybe the training was too hard or yeah do you know what it would never i would have come across loads of times where you feel like giving up um and it wouldn't have been the training too hard because i loved the training the hard of the training i really thrived on um it would have been if results weren't good or um you were away all the time and you someone beat you who shouldn't have beat you, you know that you you should have been better at um and then you'd be away and people you know all the others would have coaches or someone with them and you were on your own and all that would definitely pull you down because mm. especially between sets and the coach would come out and chat to them and you're on your own all that definitely has a big impact on your way of thinking, you know, and you could come home if you didn't do as well. And what would go through your head wouldn't be good because you're sort of saying, God, am I wasting my time doing this? Am I wasting my parents' time, my parents' money or grant money or, you know, all this work I'm putting into? Is it a waste of time? So, of course, you go through and every sport, every athlete, every athlete will, will go through really, really tough times. And that's where I think I was so grateful when I was introduced to John Connor, who's my hypno, who worked with my mental health on preparing and pre-planning and, you know, tunnel vision, all of this, because that played a massive role in my, um, you know, preparation and if things were good or if things were bad, you know, how I would say, right, that was done, get home next week is a new one let's go out and get to the finals in the next one you know so absolutely you go through a lot and, and you go through a hell of a lot of of times where you just go right that's it you know but that's where i suppose having parents behind you and support behind you and um, helps you get through those things yeah I, th I think that's i suppose one of the things that's becoming clear is that you had a very good close-knit family support around you which was crucial for you back in those days because we didn't have a high performance setup the like of which we have today. And, and I would have to say as, as somebody who, you know, has played with and against you for many years, many years ago, um, you know, I think your achievement um, in achieving your goal of playing in the Olympics, um, it was something that absolutely deserved to be marked. And I, I'm, I'm delighted and honoured to have had the opportunity tonight to talk to you uh, about your your Olympic journey. Can I just ask you before we wrap um, things up, Sonia, um, if you were doing it again today, would you do anything differently? What would you change? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, my my training would slightly change, not too much. Um, I think I had set a program out um, to peak literally the games, <clears throat> the day of my match. That went brilliant. I would have loved to have had the opportunity to work with Giles Warrington. Um, you know, for a good bit beforehand. Unfortunately, I only met him sort of a month, but how he changed, it was just like what I found a lot of my sort of compo opponents and stuff like that that were in Scotland and Wales had with them at hand all the time. So I would have loved to have had someone like Giles to work with me, you know, a lot more... I would have liked to have had a few more decisions, I suppose, with regards to Olympic Games. I'd be so grateful always, obviously, to, to Brian Smith, Mary Dine and Lucy Corcoran for coming down because they put so much um, work and help into me to, to get me to where I was. Otherwise, I wouldn't have. And there was also many other that came down and would play singles. But there would definitely be things, you know, that I would change. It's, it's done. It's dusted. Um, if I was doing it again, there definitely would be changes that I would do. Um, but you know what? I got there. I had a super experience. It still does kill me that I lost um, when I lost because I think things could have been so different. But, you know, if I was going again, that's where I think, you know, if I had what Babington Ireland has now, it's a super setup. It's, it's literally a guidance, a, a pathway that's there now. Still, I wouldn't take it away from them. They've done brilliant. Those that have qualified, Chloe McGee, Scott, absolutely brilliant, delighted. It's great to see Babington Ireland has that now. I would have loved to have had that when I was because I think it would have taken a lot more pressure. I would have had to do all the competitions and all the travel that I needed. And we, we just would have, it, it would have made it, you can't say easier to get to Olympic Games isn't easy, but it just would have been a, an easier pathway. Sure, sure. Listen, two things I want to say before we wrap this up. Firstly, um, Giles Warrington was actually on the webinar earlier on. I don't know if you're aware of that, but he actually had to leave. Hey, he's yeah, he, I, he's, he's just gone yeah. about 10 minutes ago because he had to go. Um, and I think um, there's a comment here from somebody, uh, which I think is, is something that I'll probably leave it at this. It says... Sonia was a trailblazer in 2000, but still inspires today with her energy and her positivity. Thank you for a wonderful session. And that's for so, from somebody called Liam Harvison. So Sonia, listen, it's that's been an nice. absolute privilege to have the opportunity to speak with you. I've always felt your story deserves to be told. You are the first um, Olympian um, that Badminton's had in this country. And listen, thank you very, very much for taking the time out to talk with us this evening. And also thank you to um, Carla Kennedy from Babington, Ireland for being our, I suppose, technical advisor. In the background. <laughs> thank you so much, Michael, for organising this evening. And thank, um, thank you to everybody else for um, logging in as well. We had the bones of 50 people who logged in. So a big hi to everybody and stay safe out there. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe, people. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>